<laughs> Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements for you. Uh, the one announcement that is probably most pressing is today there are directory insert pictures that are going to be taken. So if you're not in the directory and you want to be in the directory and you want people to know who you are, uh, make sure you see whoever's in charge. Is it Marilyn? Marilyn, see Marilyn. She's in the back. I'll be outside by the bench. She'll be outside by the bench. So go outside and find Marilyn and she'll take your picture and you can go in the directory. We still have eight shoe boxes up here. If anyone's interested in getting more shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, um, we have a couple that have been brought back. Uh, whenever you bring your shoe box back, make sure you put a label on it. Uh, we have a few labels that are left. And mark if it's for a boy or a girl, what age range it's for. And also um, include your $10 for shipping. And that would be good. Is that all we need to say about that? All right. We also have a video this morning to get you fired up about Operation Christmas Child if you want to watch the video here this morning. When those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. So many smiles, the children just become wild and crazy. It's indescribable. To watch that child open that box for the very first time and see the look on their faces, and it's amazing that God used a simple shoebox to bring that much joy. This is amazing, as you can see, the children's faces, they're excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. Thank you. We are very happy. God bless you. Yay! These people back behind us, they're giving their time. Families have given boxes. The enthusiasm, the excitement, it's off the charts. We're just so thankful for these volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. They are the heart of the ministry. And because of them, many children, like even me, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. What children need more than anything is love, hope, and faith in God. Every shoebox gift is an opportunity to share your faith. We thank you for this ministry that is yours, that you use a shoebox gift to go around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts with a simple shoebox gift, and from there, these gifts go around the world and are given to each child. It could be in a pickup truck, it could be the top of a bus, the roof of a taxi, camels and donkeys, canoes going up the river, whatever it takes to get these gifts into the hands of children. And that's only the beginning. After children receive the box, they get to go through a 12-lesson discipleship course. And these children, they're committing their lives to Christ, and they get to share their faith with other children. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. My name is Romina Alejandra. I really like to draw and cook. One day, I was drawing and I wanted some markers. And I asked my mother if she could buy them for me. She said no, because she didn't have the money. Today, we received gift boxes. When I opened the box and saw the markers, I was very excited. I learned about God through the box. Today, I prayed that Jesus come into my heart. I am very grateful to everyone, to God and to you all for bringing me this box. This box provides the opportunity to put a smile on a child's face, gets them to know more about Jesus Christ, and also be disciples so that they can be disciple makers in the world. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We have seen churches being planted. We have seen people being transformed. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is incredible. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. 
one box can touch, not just a child, but a whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. So if you want to be a part of Operation Christmas Child, we do still have boxes left. Whenever we run out of boxes, you can get your own box and do it. It's still fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be these boxes. These are just ordered off of Amazon anyways. They're not like special boxes. They're just boxes. So how many ever we can bring in, we'll bring in, and then we'll take them, and they'll go out, and they'll be blessing children, just like we saw in the video, uh, to hear the gospel of Jesus wherever they are in the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to come into your house for worship. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy for us today, God. We know you have new graces and new mercies for us every single day, God, and that it never fails, Lord. Even though we fail, even though we fall short of your glory day in and day out, Lord, you still love us. And we thank you for that this morning. We thank you for the gift of love and life through the cross, Jesus, that you paid it all for us today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve these children through Operation Christmas Child. And we pray that you would bless all the boxes that go out, Lord, whether it be from Forever Grace Church or other churches or individuals, Lord, that your name would be lifted up and you would prepare the hearts of each child that's going to receive these boxes for your glory. And Lord, we pray for those in our family here today, God, that are, aren't able to be here because of illness and sickness. Lord, that you would just bring healing to them, God, as there is definitely a lot of sickness going around right now. And we pray that you would heal those people, Lord. We pray for those that are going through a loss right now, Jesus, that you would have your hand on them. Lord, give them comfort and peace in this time. And Lord, we pray that you would be high and lifted up in all things in this service, God, because it's all for you, for your name to get the glory, Jesus. And we love you and we thank you and we pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Slade's going to come up this morning and read the call to worship. God, be merciful to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us. See, Lord, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And if you'll rise, we'll sing this morning. We'll begin with holy, holy, holy.
we'll continue with sanctuary. You'll be seated. Dave is going to come lead us in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and just give you the praise and the glory and the thanks for all the blessings that you continue to shower upon us. We also thank you for the challenges and the opportunities to serve you, for the challenges and the opportunities to step outside our comfort zone and serve you. We ask that you continue to open our hearts and our minds to those opportunities and that the Holy Spirit fills us and leads us to do your will. Heavenly Father, I especially give thanks this morning for our pastors, for Pastor Gary and Pastor Casey that are so faithful and so loving and so filled with your grace, and they continually give that to each one of us. 
I ask that you always be with them, that you guide them in what they are to do and what they are to say. And we just ask that you continually protect them from illness, from injury, and from the evil things that try to surround us and take us over in this world. Dear Lord, I especially thank you for this church, not this building, but this body of believers that come to worship and to praise you. I just ask that you continue to use this church to build your kingdom, to make more disciples for Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, we just ask all this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.
took all the breath I have. <laughs> Morning, I am, uh, I am Pastor Gary, one of the pastors here at the church, and so if you're a guest here today and you've wondered who these people are up front, Casey was, uh, Pastor Casey was up here first, and, and now I've got the duty of uh, giving the message today, and it's been a little while since I've been in the pulpit, so uh, bear with me, I'll try to remember what I'm supposed to do. I've only been doing this for a few years now, so I'm going to be in, I'm going to be in Mark today, uh, reading a little bit in Mark, and it's in your bulletin this morning, the scriptures that I'm going to be talking about, and we're going to, we're going to have a little uh, conversation today about It Is Well With My Soul, which is a song that uh, we're going to sing when we close today, so it's, um, the, the, I did, it's not a typo in your bulletin. It actually, the title of the sermon is As Well With My Soul, and the song we're going to sing is As Well With My Soul. So now that you've been clarified on that, right? Mark, we're in Mark, Mark 21. Um, beginning with 21, it says, When Jesus had crossed, again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, and a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. I think that's an important thing for you to remember as we go forward. He fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. I'm going to ask you to skip over then to 35. The story continues. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the little girl stood walked, began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. God's word for God's people this morning. Would you, would you bow with me for a moment? Father, I pray that you would, uh, you would come the speaker for just a moment and allow him to give the spirit with which this conversation is to take place. I pray for this messenger, Father, because he's a sinner saved by grace. He's just another man. So, Father, your words are important. Your spirit is more important. That the spirit bring those words through this messenger to these people today. So, Father, we just pray over each one that's listening today, whether they're online or whether they're in the sanctuary today. May they hear your words loud and strong. In the name of Jesus, amen. In 1871, 152 years, 151 years ago, 1871, tragedy struck struck Chicago. A fire ravaged the entire city. Now, I know that was way before any of us were around. But it was an event that has carried on through history. Fire ravaged the city. When it was finally extinguished, the fire had taken over 300 lives and left 100,000 people homeless. A man by the name of Horatio Gates Spafford S-P-A-F-F-O-R-D, Horatio Spafford, was one of those who tried to help the people of the city get back on their feet. He was a Chicago lawyer. He had invested heavily into that downtown area. 
And he too lost all of his properties as a result of that fire. More tragically was the year before, Spafford had lost his only son. So in, the, in those two years, he lost much. But what he did for the next two years was assist the homeless, help the impoverished, and all the grief-stricken people. Instead of thinking about himself, he thought of others. How can I help them? At the end of those two years, when things had gotten back to somewhat of a normal state, he and his family decided to take a trip to England. You see, they were friends with D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a very famous evangelistic pastor and preacher at that time who did crusades, and the Spafford family was friends with the Moody's. And he was going to be speaking, D.L. Moody was going to be speaking over in Europe, so the family took was going to take a family vacation by ship across the ocean to take a vacation and also listen to D.L. Moody. Just as they were prepared to leave, Horatio had to send his wife and four daughters on ahead because business got in the way of him being on the ship. He said, I'll catch up with you on the other side as soon as possible. The ship would sink because it hit another ship out in the ocean. It would sink. Within 20 minutes, it had gone down. Horatio's wife, Anna, was able to cling to a piece of floating wreckage, and she was one of only 47 out of the 300-plus that were on the ship that survived. Their four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie, all perished. Horatio received a terrible telegram from his wife that said two words, saved alone. Obviously, Spafford then boarded a ship, the next available ship, to go be with his wife. As they were sailing across the ocean to the point where to find his wife, the captain of the ship called Spafford to the, up to the captain's deck and said, I want you to know we are now in the area where the ship, your ship sank with your daughters. Just wanted you to know that, so maybe you could be aware. He went to his cabin below, Spafford, Horatio Spafford did, and he penned these words, when peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, no trial, though trial should come, lest this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Every one of us have been impacted by some sort of trial tragedy, challenge in life, either individually or as community. Whether it is illness or infirmities, we have all experienced some sort of pain. We've all had trials in our life. It's because we live in a broken world. We like to think we're doing really, really well, but we are broken people. We are humans and we are broken And when you're broken like we are, there's going to be trials that we need to adjust to, tragedies that take place that we have to adjust to. I was uh, was very honored and blessed this last uh, weekend to be a part of a 72-hour faith-building group of men. I was fortunate to be on the spiritual team that goes, it's called the Lafayette Great Banquet. For those of you that know that, you'll understand if, you, if you've never been to the Lafayette Great Banquet, you have, no, you, you have no clue what I'm talking about because you will not understand all of that. But it's the 72 hours of faith building. On Thursday evening, we went in to, as a team, 
and there were guests that came to be to go through the 72 hours with us that we were to we were to help we were to to build faith up in them we were to show them Jesus there was one particular young man that came and he looked dejected and like he didn't have a friend in the world I began to hear his story over the weekend, and his story was that he had lost multiple family members over the last four months. He became angry. He was mad at the world. He was certainly mad with God, at God. So mad that even his wife didn't care to be around him. You see, uh, we... We gathered around him and we began to pray for him and do things for him and he heard various talks that went on through that weekend and by Saturday afternoon he had unloaded much of the burdens and things of life that were hurting him most and he realized he was not alone. There are others in the world that have to go through tragedies, trials just as he does. By Sunday, he had a big smile on his face. He realized that Jesus was there for him. In our gospel today, we're confronted with a father, Horatio, who has experienced a trial and a tragedy. But we also have in the, Matthew, in the Mark thing, uh, uh, scripture, Jairus. Jairus, his heart is broken. He's in the midst of tragedy. He turns to Jesus that day. See, death showed up on Jairus' doorstep. Death had come for his 12-year-old daughter. We're told in this story that Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. He was a man of quite, quite a bit of prominence. He was important. He was important to the people around him, especially the community he was in. And he was a man who had much. But at this moment in time, none of it, none of it, none of it mattered. It was highly unusual for Jairus to come to Jesus for anything. Because Jairus is of the prominence where he didn't really need anything else. He had everything. See, when Jairus spoke, people listened. When he walked into a room, everyone would stand in his recognition. But now he finds himself in a place where none of that matters. Sickness and death could care less about who you are, by the way. Sickness could care less who you are. It could care less what you possess. It could care less what position you have in life. It could care less what you do. I can assure you that Jairus would have traded everything he had at that moment for the power to change the moment for his daughter not to be deathly ill. I recall sitting at the bedside of a really good friend a few years ago. I'd done a lot of things, business with him. He and I had been business partners for a while. We were good friends. I sat at his bedside as he was dying of esophageal cancer. It was just him and I in the room that day. I knew he had gone to church all of his life. As a matter of fact, he'd been in, he'd visited here a time or two in this church. But I wasn't sure, all the years I'd been working with him, I wasn't sure if he knew Jesus. I sat at his bedside, 
And I said to him, Jer, my Bible says if I know Jesus and ask him into my heart, I get to go to heaven. Can you tell me today that you've done that? And he reached over and put his hand on top of mine and said, I think I should do that today. You see, this man was of much wealth. He had business all over the country. He'd done very, very well. Belize was a place that he and his wife flew in and out of a lot. Money was not a problem. I can assure you, he would have given it all up. Not to die. You see, life became very defined for him. It became very defined for Jairus. Death had come to the house of Jairus, and he had come for the real treasure. That, that, that death was coming for the real treasure. What Jairus really loved was his daughter. His one and only daughter. You see, let me just tell you today that hell could care less about who you are. Hell could care less who you are or what you have or what you think you have or what position you have. When tragedy and death come calling, you better know the one that is greater than you. You better know the one who saves. Life becomes crystal clear when tragedy is upon us. What you think matters now, what you think is important, will cease to matter. Trials. Trials really put life into perspective, don't they? Trials can define us. They speak to the maturity of our faith. The name Jairus, I, I looked it up and it says, Jairus means he whom God enlightens. He whom God enlightens. Please notice that this man, this man of position and power came before Jesus. And as I pointed out when I read the scripture, don't forget this part, he fell at Jesus' feet. He didn't just walk up and go, hey, hey, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, could you help me out here? This is a man of prominence who most looking at him would go, he doesn't need Jesus. He's got everything he needs. But Jairus knew that if I fall at the feet of Jesus and I give myself to Jesus, if I turn myself over to him and I ask him for help, he will help me. In other words, this man of prominence humbled himself in the presence of the Lord of the glory. He, in order to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, you must, you must humble yourself. One of the most difficult things I've had to do is take the pride off of me and be humble. My good friend Greg Johnson often tells me, be humble. Be humble. One of the, tr one of the greatest truths in, in the scriptures is, is the way up is down. The way up is, the way up is to empty yourself. The, the, way, the way to get up is, is to empty yourself of what's weighing you down, what's keeping you where you shouldn't be. You see, that's what this, the young man I was telling you about that, that came to the banquet and he was just weighed down with everything of life that was pushing him down. He couldn't get his mind off the fact that he'd lost four good friends within the last four months, including some relatives. 
But on Saturday afternoon, he emptied himself of all that. He gave it all up to Jesus. He said, I take it away from me. I don't want it anymore. Take everything I have. Take it. I just want you, Jesus. Jesus is really crystal clear about all this, that to, to be great in God's kingdom, you must be a servant. And that's one thing that Jesus shows us, teaches us how to be a servant. A servant to all. We pick and choose sometimes who we want to be able to serve. I saw a man come into the banquet. He wouldn't dress very well. It, his hands were dirty because he's a mechanic. And his hands were dirty and his clothes were just clothes that we wouldn't wear. I changed my, my thought process on him really, really very quickly because when we started worshiping in song, his were the first hands to go in the air. These dirty mechanic hands with an old shirt on, an old pair of pants, and shoes that you and I would probably throw away. See, Jesus didn't care what he looked like. You must be clothed in grace. When we come to the place where we see our own inability and his ability, then and only then are we in a position to receive fully from him. When, Jesus, when, Jair, when Jairus came to Jesus, he fell down before him and he makes his petition to the Lord. In Mark 5.23, he said, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so she may be made well and live. What a statement of faith. He understood he understood this man of prominence had been around to see Jesus enough to know that if he fell at his feet and he could ask Jesus to lay hands on my daughter, she will be well. Great statement of faith. You see, each of us must re reach the place in our lives where we know that while we, we cannot, he can he can. Jesus is moved by this man's faith. Jesus goes with Jairus to his house. Now, when we read the scripture, and I didn't read it today, I skipped over it. He has some, Jesus has a couple obstacles on his way there. But he goes to the house of Jairus. And, of course, the people think he's late because they say, yeah, she's already died. So my question for you today, do you have the faith of Jairus? Is your relationship with Jesus, is it really where it needs to be? Is your faith in him rise to the level that Jairus's did? Are your eyes upon Jesus? Are you focused on the King of Kings? Are you focused on the Lord of Lords? Then nothing, no thing, no trial can bring you down. That doesn't mean it won't be challenging. That, don't, that doesn't mean that there won't be times where the battle seems like you're losing. It means in the end you will win. Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus and begs him to come. Come. Come and save my daughter. The scripture simply states, and he, Jesus, went with him. 
You see, Jesus says to all of us, I did not come to be served, but to serve. How can we do less? This encounter with Jairus puts us into perspective. The importance of the one among the many. Jesus left the crowd to minister to a single person. See, that's what Jesus was about. Yes, he spoke to the crowds. He spoke to a lot of crowds. But he was about the person, the individual. Jesus was never too busy to respond to the needs of the people. And he is not too busy today to respond to your need. When you think about Jesus, was his public ministry was just three years long. Or maybe three short years. It's amazing what he accomplished. It's amazing what he's done. But it was usually about the individual. I mean, we know, we know um, about the woman with the issue with the blood. We know about the blind man uh, by the side of the road. We know about the epileptic youth that brought about a distraught father. We know about the troubled tax collector. We know about the widow weeping over the dead son. I mean, he was about individuals. And as you and I look at the needs of this world, how many people, I don't even know how many people are in this world. It's got to be billions. But as we look at the needs of this world, many of them are perishing daily. And we can become overwhelmed thinking about how are we going to help these people? I mean, we're just a little... Montmorency, we're just a little town. We're just us. I mean, it makes us, if you really start thinking about how am I going to help change the world, it makes you kind of wring your hands a little bit. Like, uh, I don't know how I'm going to change this world. It seems like it's crashing rapidly. All Jesus is asking you to do is reach out. Reach out to the hurt, to the unbroken, to the people around you. And folks, we, we need to start looking at just those people around us that we're around every day. We're human and we make quick judgments sometimes. I made a quick judgment on a guy who had dirty hands and less than nice clothes. And I quickly was told by Jesus, by his display, that he was a child of God. So what do we do? I, I read a story about an author who, uh, <clears throat> he liked to go to the ocean. He, he kind of got, you know, that was his place to go to get, you know, some people go to the mountains, some people go to various places. He got, he got, he got stimulation for his, his writing by going to the ocean and walking the beach and being out there. And one day he was at the beach and he was walking along and he saw this, up ahead of him he saw what, it looked like someone dancing along the beach and he thought, oh, that's, that's different. You, know, you don't ever see too many people dancing on the beach. And as he got closer he realized that he wasn't really, this young, ma young man wasn't really dancing. He was picking up objects on the beach and he was throwing them back out into the ocean. He would pick up something and throw it back out into the ocean. And the author said, I got up to him and I realized that he was picking up, he was picking up starfish off of the beach and he was throwing them back in the water. And he said, young man, I, can I ask you what you're doing? He said, I'm throwing starfish back into the ocean. So then he asked him, well, what, why, why are you doing that? Well, he said, well, the sun is up and the tide is, is going out. And if I don't throw these starfish back in, they're going to die. And the author said, well, look down the beach. There are hundreds of these starfish as far as you can your, your job is endless. You'll never get all this done. 
And the young man picked up one more starfish and he said, it's going to matter to this starfish. You see, we can't possibly, we can't possibly reach everyone. But we can reach the people that are around us. We can talk to those around us and sometimes we get so busy, me included, And then we make judgments on who we should talk to and who we shouldn't talk to. Be a starfish thrower. When you're experiencing pain, when you're experiencing trials, do not be afraid. I would say to you today, rise up in the power of Jesus and become a starfish thrower. Matthew 25, 40 tells us, Inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. You see, Jairus' little girl is no longer sick. They think she's dead. And at this tragic moment, it's interesting how faith reacts. Jairus placed his faith in Jesus. And even in the face of death, his faith did not waver. Even in the middle of tragedy, his faith did not waver. Because Jesus said to him, Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. Great word of faith, only believe. Jesus said to him, don't believe what you hear. Don't believe what you know. Don't believe what you see. Instead, trust me and believe in me. And that is what faith is saying to us today. Every instinct and every indicator may say the situation is hopeless, but faith looks to trust in and believes in God. A God who is greater than anything we can hear. greater than anything we can know, greater than anything we can see. Beloved, telling you right now, those who lack faith in Jesus were excluded from entering the room of this young man. If you, if you listen to that scripture, if you want to go back and read it, he didn't let everyone come in there because some of them were in unbelief. They were laughing at him that he was saying, Jesus said to them, she's just asleep, she's not dead. And they laughed at him. So he just asked a few close disciples to come with him. Faith believes the incredible. Faith sees the invisible. Faith receives the impossible. You are a starfish thrower, each one of you. Spafford's Ending verses speak to those who are mature in faith. He's, 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 his song says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. God promises that when trials come, that with him, we can go through them and not remain in them. That's an important piece for you to pick up today. It gets us, he gets us through them so that we don't remain in them. You see, one of the challenges that my young friend from the banquet had was he was remaining in that sorrow. He was remaining in those things that were burdening the most. And once he realized that God was going to be with him and he could get through them, it made him a different person. It's my hope and my prayer that in the midst of every trial, in the midst of every tribulation, 
you can declare the faith, the faith that Jairus had. And as Teresa and Linda come this way this morning, we're going to, we're going to sing this final song. The song is, It Is Well With My Soul. It's the song that Horatio Spafford wrote. He penned that day in the boat as he traveled across the ocean, across where his four daughters had perished. So as they come this way, I'm going to ask if you would all stand. Open your hymn book. It'll be up on the screen also as we sing it as well with my soul. song that um, came out of tragedy, a tragedy that he lost his son, he lost all his property, lost his daughters, and yet he was willing to tell God, it is well with my soul. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, some that are listening Online and some that are in this sanctuary today are struggling with trials, with things that are going on within them and around their families and within their friendships and their workplaces that are struggling. Lord, we we know full well that this 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 world's not always fair. There are things that are to come to us that are delayed, that 
we need. They don't get to us because of this world. We know there are, we know there are court cases where one single judge makes a decision that may not be the decision that we want. We may have a, we may have a child that has made a mistake and is incarcerated. And it's a challenge, a difficulty to get through. It may be seeing your old church closed down because there just weren't enough kids to keep it going. But you, God, you alone, if we but have faith in you, if we give all we have to you and we serve you, Father, you promise you will walk us through it. You will get us to the other side. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. And today, Lord, in the quiet of this building, we say we love you. We adore you. We honor you. We put our trust in you, Father, today. And Lord, if there's someone here today that's really being challenged and, and they've just never accepted you as Jesus into their life, may this be the very moment that they ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness of the sins that they've committed and say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be with you. I want you to be in my life. Today is the day for that. Because tomorrow, the tragedy may strike. So today, Father, we just praise you. We're going to give you all the glory because you are a mighty God. Creator of all things. You created this earth. We know full well you can help us. Today, Father, may you receive all that glory. In Jesus' name. And the body of Christ said, amen. We have Sunday school up here for the adults. The kids are downstairs. Um, there's coffee downstairs. There's going to be pictures taken. Chili. Chili. Okay, pictures are up here. If you want your picture taken for the directory, come up here for those of you that aren't in it. And God bless you all. Love you. See you later. <laughs>